All right, well, hello everybody and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Monarch Population Trends, Conservation and Climate Change with Dr. Chip Taylor. The Grow Native program is a native plant marketing and education program that serves the lower Midwest run by the Missouri Prairie Foundation. My name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Foundation. I want to thank all of you for joining us here today, and I also want to thank our Grow Native sponsors listed here on the screen. During the presentation today, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen, and at the end, Kara will come on to read those out to Chip. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. The link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and the Q&A session. So to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Chip Taylor is the founder and director of Monarch Watch and an emeritus professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Kansas. He's trained as an insect ecologist at the University of Connecticut, and he's researched migratory behavior of monarch butterflies, as well as other insect topics over the years. In 1992, uh, Dr. Taylor founded Monarch Watch. It's an outreach program focused on education, research and conservation related to monarch butterflies. Since then, Monarch Watch has uh, enlisted the help of volunteers to tag monarchs during the fall mi migration. Over 2 million monarchs have been tagged by volunteers since 1992. Um, of these, over 19,000 have been recovered. So the data from this program are providing many new insights about the dynamics of the fall monarch migration. So now take it away, Chip. Well, thank you very much, Brooke, and thank you to the Missouri Prairie Foundation for this invitation to give it a little talk here. Um, I'm very pleased to, pleased to be able to talk to so many uh, enthusiastic monarch and prairie supporters. Well, I'm just going to go through a, a whole set of slides that uh, have to do with uh, climate change. I'm not going to give you a, an in-depth lecture about all the factors that are associated with climate change, but I'm gonna make you aware of a lot of the basic data. Now, the uh, situation with climate change is that it's in, the, it's in the news almost every day. And you hear all sorts of dire stories about this and that sort of happening, but hardly anybody shows you the data. We're gonna look at some data so that you can see what is actually happening in various cities around the country, what's happening in the country as a whole, uh, what that means for pollinators, what that means for monarch butterflies, and ultimately probably what that means for prairie preservation as well, which is one of your big concerns. So uh, pay attention to the data. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of it, but it's not scary. It, um, and it's not something that you really keep in mind, but if you want to check on any of the things that I'm gonna show you, uh, it's all over the internet. You can find a lot of data on climate change on the internet. One of my favorite sites is something called Climate at a Glance. Uh, it's a very good site with records that go back to 1895. And I'm gonna show you a lot of those data um, as we go on today. So I changed my title a little bit because I give this talk at various times. So we're gonna be talking about climate change, monarchs, pollinators, insects, and of course us, because ultimately, we are going to be affected by climate change just as much as all of these other critters are going to be affected. So while we're going to be focusing on monarchs and this is this beautiful female monarch, uh, what we're also going to have to be aware of is that uh, all other creatures out there, big and small, are going to be similarly affected or affected in some way uh, by the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Well, this is a hard pitch that I'm gonna make, but I'm gonna tell you that monarchs are an enzyme. And every time I say that, I, it's kind of a shock. What, how can monarchs be an enzyme? Well, if you've taken basic biochemistry, what you learn is that enzymes have an activation curve. And that's what's shown here. An activation curve that's a function of temperature. So if you look at enzyme activity on the vertical axis, you see that it goes up as temperature increases as you go from left to right until you get to an optimum. And after you've exceeded an optimum, your activation of this enzyme starts to decline very fast. So in other words, there is a dynamic here between enzyme activity and temperature 
uh, for all enzymes. But for an invertebrate organism like a monarch butterfly that operates simply on the basis of temperature, in effect, that makes a monarch butterfly an enzyme. It has within its physiology, effectively an enzyme activation curve. And on that curve, there is a developmental zero on this particular graph, it's way over there at zero for developmental zero for the lowest temperature. And then it's a little bit above 50 degrees on the other side. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the limit. That's the limit within which a particular enzyme functions. If it gets hotter than in the mid fifties there, the enzyme doesn't function. If it gets lower than zero on this particular graph, the enzyme doesn't function. Well, the same applies to insects. The same applies to monarch butterflies. The same actually applies to plants and believe it or not, it applies to us. So if you look at developmental zeros for monarchs and insects, uh, the lower developmental zero is about 53 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, if the temperature drops down to 52 degrees, there's no development, there's no growth. They just sit there, they metabolize, but they don't do anything, they can't grow. On the other hand, if the temperature gets above 50 or 91 degrees, again, uh, they have to sit quietly, they can't grow, they can't feed, they can't do anything. The optimal temperature for a monarch butterfly and for a lot of other insects is about 84 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's an optimum. Why I'm telling you all of this is that weather is not always optimal. Weather is sometimes too hot, sometimes it's too cold, sometimes it's just right. That's the uh, uh, that's the Goldilocks and the great and the and the three bears the interpretation of ecology. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's just right. Well, you can see there that I've got lethal temperatures there too, and then you've got developmental zeros for plants, uh, usually a little bit less than fifty degrees Fahrenheit, a little bit more than for the higher end, a little bit more than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And then curiously, the optimum for photosynthesis, that is plant growth, is at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So, and you can see I've thrown some things in there about the lethal temperatures for human beings as well. So yeah, we are an enzyme. And we have to function within certain limits. However, we have the advantage of being able to move around and create shelters for ourselves and so on and so forth. And none of these other organisms can do that. They have to live in the wild and they're vulnerable to all of the temperature changes. So we have to be aware of all of that. All right, so this brings up what we might start with here in terms of past climates and events. Just a kind of reminder here. The glass glacial maximum was 600,000 years ago. Uh, before present. And so the last glacial period was about 11,700 years ago. In other words, most of this country, and I'll show you the extent of it, uh, was the, the northern part of the country anyway, was covered with a glacier about 11,000 years ago. But little known to most of us, unless you've read the book, is a book called The Little Ice Age, which describes what happened between 1300 and 1850. 1850, that's pretty doggone recent. But during that period from 1300 to 1850, there were lots of volcanic events. There were lots of shifting pressure, pressures. There were droughts that got so cold that the glaciers were increasing in Switzerland and swallowed up whole. Spontaneously development of fossil fuels and we'll get to that in a moment. And then we had some other kind of spectacular events that really kind of changed history. I mean, there, there um, are stories about how climate has affected and is continuing to affect uh, history. And one of those effects that you can see is from a volcano called Tambora. Tambora blew off in the Southeast Asia uh, around 1815 and it was put up such a dust veil in the upper atmosphere that it created what was called the year without a summer. I suggest that you look at up, look up the year without a summer. In New England, it was so dramatic that it was really startling. People were seeing snow in July. Crops failed tremendously. Uh, it, the, the weather was so bad that year that it chased a lot of people out of New England entirely. 
and they colonized the Ohio River Valley as a result. Uh, it had a major uh, impact on, on human distribution, on emigration out of New England into the Ohio River Valley. And then you have Krakatoa. Krakatoa was one of the big volcanoes uh, historically, put up a dust veil that uh, created this tremendous cloud that changed the color of the sky uh, in such a way that it became historic. In fact, one of the interesting things about volcanoes, I mean, there are a number of interesting things about volcanoes, but one of them is that Krakatoa produced such a change in the color of the sky that the artists captured that. And the most famous image of that is the screen by Edouard uh, Munch in 1893, uh, created this image in remembrance of the, the stark colors of the sky. Well, once this concept that, that artists were um, picking up the idea that uh, this, the volcanoes were changing the uh, images in the sky at the end of the day, people began to go through uh, art through history and discovered a number of volcanic eruptions in art, represented in art because they were represented in the sky. Anyway, I've got, I've got a little teaser for you. I bet you all didn't know who was the first person who figured out that volcanoes were associated with climates. I'm not hearing anybody. Ah, somebody said Ben Franklin. You're right. It was Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin was in Paris. And Ben Franklin being in Paris experienced a very cold summer. And he reasoned that it had to be a volcanic dust eruption that was so high that it was changing It was an Icelandic volcano that had created this dust veil over the uh, European sky at that time. Anyway, little, little tidbits about the importance of volcanoes. And we haven't had a big volcanic eruption uh, that has produced a big dust veil since 1992. That was Mount Pinatubo. We are now experiencing a volcanic eruption that is putting up some uh, dust high enough to make a difference. That's in St. Vincent. There is news about that in the news these days, um, but whether that produces enough dust to really make a difference is yet to be seen. All right, so let's look at the changes. This is the global land and ocean temperature change uh, since the 1880s. And you can see that we've gone into the red there. We've, we've passed the, uh, the stable point of, of uh, change and we're increasing. Now that, um, graph goes up to about one degree centigrade. And that's for the whole planet, the January to December. If we cut that back and we look at the May, September for the temperature anomalies in the Northern hemisphere, we can see that it's actually increased a little bit more than it did for the whole planet. And this is because land masses, which are predominant in the Northern hemisphere, heat up faster than ocean temperatures do. So we have been experiencing a, a real increase in the Northern Hemisphere and, and um, really since the 1940s, but more conspicuously since about the, the 1970s, something really changed in the 1970s. I, I keep talking about this to a lot of people. I see a signal in a lot of the data that something happened in the early 1970s that really changed the dynamic but some sort of a tipping point where after that, we're generally seeing increasing temperatures or in the ocean, uh, along the coasts, um, um, just almost anywhere you look, you'll see something has happened associated with the mid seventies. And it was in the seventies that people really began to notice uh, dramatic changes in the phenology of plants and uh, the responses of various organisms to temperature and so on and so forth. So a whole ecological movement started to take place in the 70s, trying to match what was going on with animal and plant life with the changes that were taking place uh, that were obvious by the time we got to the 1970s. All right, this is a couple of uh, semesters of a course in climatology just represented in this one slide. 
And I'll know, I know that looks scary. There's a lot of detail in there and I'm not gonna go through it, but I wanna point out this slide, I wanna show you this slide simply because uh, the <clears throat> complexities of this whole system that we live in are extreme. And we have to understand how all of these interactions take place. And this involves a lot of people doing this who have spend their lives gathering data trying to measure the impact of one factor or another on the overall uh, system. Um, so we look at you know, how much CO2 is put up in the atmosphere, how much methane is up there. Uh, we look at uh, changes in the amount of uh, solar input because if there's a kind of a solar flux, we look at volcanic activity, we look at uh, the hydrosphere, that is the ocean, we look at the uh, the effect of snow cover and glaciers and so on and so forth. All of these things are, are dynamic. They're all connected and one influences another. And therefore, uh, we're dealing with a system that is not only complex and hard to understand, but uh, one which, when it does change, uh, is almost irreversible. In other words, it, the inputs uh, really are going to change the outputs for a significant length of time, even if we um, reduce the inputs. There, you know, there's a lot of talk about CO2 inputs today will not be fully felt for 30 years. That's something to think about. There are lags in this system. There are lags of response. In other words, you can put an input in today, but you will not see the full response until some time later. It, that's because of the size of the system and the uh, extent of the inputs. So this dynamic uh, needs to be understood. It is being studied. It shouldn't be dismissed. These are high quality people that are doing this kind of work. Uh, they're doing their best to understand how the system works. And they're trying to tell us all about it. So when they tell us that climate change is, a, is an issue, uh, it's on the basis of some really thorough study. Now we are covered with an envelope of an atmosphere and that atmosphere protects us in a lot of different ways that I don't have time to talk about. But what this points out is that uh, we have uses for this stratosphere, or this, this atmosphere uh, in the sense that we fly commercial planes in it. We spy, have spy planes that uh, fly up there at uh, 12, 000, or 12, 12 and a half miles high. We have weather satellites that are up there uh, the International Space Station is 254 miles above the planet and so on in a permanent orbit. Um, so this, um, this stratospheric zone that is shown here is the important one because that's where the dust veil is. So in order for a volcano to have an impact, uh, the dust has to get up there past um, the lower portion of the stratosphere usually has to get up there about uh, 10, uh, 15, even 20 miles up in the air. And then you've got this uh, uh, protective cloud of reflective material that uh, will create, before it falls out of the atmosphere, create a, a kind of a shadow on the planet that will reduce the temperature for a couple of years. All right, let's get to CO2 because that's the big bugaboo. That's the one that's really uh, the one that's in the news. It's the one that's perhaps least understood and most argued about and so on and so forth. If you look at this long-term record of CO2, you go back 800,000 years, and you can see that CO2 goes up and down, up and down. When it goes up, it's warm. When it goes down, it's cold. You're looking at glacial and interglacial periods there with the rise and fall of, the, of CO2. So we'll get to why that's rising and falling uh, in a moment, but uh, the point is that it's varying. But it never in historical times has never, or in the, in the record anyway, has never gotten above uh, 300 parts per million. And you can see that in the middle of this, this particular figure here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's right there. Never got above 300 parts per million in all of 800,000 years until very recently. And now it's well above 300 parts per million. It's, it's approaching 420 parts per million very rapidly. So let's find out why. Well, the human population in 1850 was 
two billion people. Now it's 7.7 .7 billion people and increasing rapidly. And the reason for this increase in human population, which has been absolutely extraordinary given the amount of time, I and mean, we're talking less than, we're talking, you know, we're talking 170 years and look at the, the magnificent change in the human population. That's due to the use of fossil fuels, particularly coal and that is solid fuels that are coal and then liquid fuels based on oil products. And then of course we've used, used uh, oil and various derivatives from oil to manufacture plastics and all sorts of other things. So uh, we have medicines that come out of all of this. And you know, it, it is completely, we're in an age of energy that has completely changed the human dynamic from 1850 on. And we have to recognize that, accept that. I mean, there's a lot of good things that have happened as a result of the adoption of fossil fuels. It has really changed human history in a major way. On the other hand, there is no free lunch. There is a bite. And the bite is that we've produced a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, uh, on this, the way this presentation is being uh, shown here, I cannot see the, the far right of the screen, but if you can follow me here, the total carbon emissions is uh, indicated by this uh, higher line here, uh, this kind of brownish line. And then you have gas fuel indicated here, you have liquid fuel, solid fuel, cement production, which is a major portion of, of uh, CO2 production, gas flaring and so on and so forth. And you can see there's been a general increase in uh, CO2 because of the millions of metric tons of carbon that have been put in the atmosphere through time. So there's a price to pay. And that price to pay has to do with uh, how much CO2 is out there and what CO2 does. CO2 is basically a greenhouse gas, which means that what it does is that it allows energy to come back, to come to the Earth's surface. But as the energy goes back from the Earth's surface, this goes back to that complicated slide that I was talking about before. As the energy goes back, reflected off the Earth's surface, uh, it's at a lower state. And at that lower state, it's trapped by CO2. So in effect, it's like the glass in a greenhouse. Um, it is trapping outgoing energy. Uh, it's accepting incoming energy, but trapping the lower energy level that's going out. So that has the effect of holding energy in, in, the, in the atmosphere where the CO2 has been increasing. So I won't go into this in, in great detail, but you can see that basically we're looking at a track that goes from about the 1860s uh, right up to the present. And you can see that uh, CO2 uh, is, uh, is uh, from fossil fuels, is, is really the, the driver of this whole thing. Um, well, it's a complicated slide. It's hard to look at all of the detail there, but uh, in effect, you're, you're looking at a correlation here of CO2 and temperature uh, and the amount of uh, parts per million of CO2 uh, through time. If you wanna look at what's happening today, tomorrow or the next day or last month, uh, you can look at a particular website. Just type in CO2 uh, into a browser and you will pull up this particular figure here, which will tell you that you're talking about atmospheric CO2 and you're looking at a website that'll give you a, kind of an up-to-date on what CO2 is doing right now. CO2 is highest in April. So we're at the highest point of the year of the CO2 right now. And that's because we've gone through winter in the upper, uh, in the Northern hemisphere and the winter we have, don't have plants pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so we have decay mostly and CO2 goes up. So on April 9th, which is when I pulled these data down, it was 419 parts per million um, CO2. And then if we go back to a year ago, it was 17, um, there were 14 or 4,417 parts CO2 um, last year at this time. And then we have to consider other gases and there's, there's a real worry here about the first one, methane. Methane is being re released at a very rapid rate as the permafrost is uh, decaying and, uh, and defrosting up in the Northern uh, uh, latitudes. And the result is that methane, which is getting into the atmosphere at an increasing amount, uh, is also contributing to the heating of the planet. Uh, nitrous oxide is, uh, is a long 
uh, long-term long -term persisting um, greenhouse gas, but there is not a lot of it, nor are there lots of chlorinated gases up there, but methane and CO2 are really the ones that we have to be concerned about, particularly uh, CO2 because it lasts so long in the atmosphere. Well, climate change, again, uh, dwelling on CO2 is a little bit more. Uh, we can look at what's happened over the last year, and we've increased by almost three parts per million CO2 for the last year. What uh, I think we're looking at, even though last year was a year where CO2 was actually down a bit because of COVID, uh, we're still looking at an increase in COVID that is pretty substantial. And the outcome of all of this is that we might be looking at 500 parts per million sometime around 2045. But if we get to that particular point, everything is going to change. 2045 and 500 parts per million CO2, that's not a good combination. We're going to be spending most of our time and money trying to deal with climate change if we get to 500 parts per million CO2. It's going to be a major, major change. All right, one of the terms that you hear a little bit about is climate forcing. And climate forcing is our major cause of climate change. You know, we talked about CO2 and uh, interglacial periods and so on and so forth. That's not climate forcing, that's natural change. And we'll talk about the basic cause for that in a minute. But climate forcing is something that has to do with the influence of climate that originates from outside the climate system. And that includes the oceans, land surface, cryosphere, biosphere, and so on and so forth. So examples of external forcings include surface reflectivity. And from that, we call that albedo. And you know that could be snow, it could be white roofs. What we're talking about is something that reflects the incoming energy back out into space. We need a lot of that. And what's going on around the world is there's a lot of conversion to white buildings, white roofs, and we're trying to reflect a lot of that energy back into space. Um, I've been into cities where, uh, in different parts of the world where there's a lot of white roofs and a lot of white paint um, with the intention of reducing the heat absorbing uh, capacity of buildings. White roofs are becoming really common. Uh, I think it's Walmart that makes a white roof on every new building and there are even uh, municipalities that say for every new building or every roof replacement, uh, it has to be a white roof simply because uh, we want to um, reduce the amount of incoming energy. And of course, it's economical to have a white roof because you reduce your uh, uh, costs of, um, uh, of cooling if you have to have, if you're in an environment where a lot of cooling is needed. Um, uh, and human induced changes in greenhouse gases, fossil fuels, that's a, a climate forcing a factor. And there's atmospheric uh, aerosols, and industrial output. And so if you look at this group here, this examples of external forcing, uh, human beings have a lot to do with uh, this climate forcing. And so our activities in terms of dealing with climate change could be directed at some of these activities. So we reduce the amount of external uh, forcing um, that uh, has man made. All right, now let's get to something that's really complicated, but simple at the same time. The earth is tipped on an axis. And we know that the seasons depend upon how close, how much we're tipped toward the sun or tipped away from the sun on an annual cycle. Well, that axis is not a permanent axis. That axis actually wobbles a bit. And historically, that axis wobbles in three different directions. And we're not aware of it because the whole process is very, very slow. But these, these cycles affect the amount of sunlight and therefore energy that Earth absorbs from the sun. They provide a strong framework for understanding long-term changes in Earth's climate, including the beginning of the ice ages throughout Earth's history. In other words, the slight wobble that the planet ex experiences on probably a, a 100 to 250,000 year cycle, depending upon whose literature you read, uh, determines whether we're going to go into a cold period or a warm period. That aside, given this previous slide, um, even though we probably are in an era where we should be cooling a bit, climate forcing because of our human activity mostly 
is changing that dynamic. So we're probably not cooling to the extent that would be expected at this point in the Earth's history. All right, this shows you that in your beloved Missouri that you've got uh, uh, glaciers that came down about halfway into Missouri as much as about 11,000 years ago. And it's, it's uh, kind of came down into my area of Kansas too. And I've got neighbors uh, just a couple hundred yards from me that have got a lot of glacial till uh, still in their yards and big red rocks that came from somewhere up north. So uh, still dwelling on CO2 because that's the bugaboo that we have to think about and have to put in historical context. Um, it was 5.3 to 2.6 million years ago that the last time was that we had CO2 this high. Um, the earth was several degrees warmer, sea levels were an estimated 50 degrees, 50 foot higher than they are today and the forest grew as far north as the Arctic. So we are really in uncharted territory here in terms of, of CO2 levels. Uh, we're, you know, we're a long way away from where this happened uh, a long time ago. And if we left CO2 right where it is today in a couple hundred thousand years, perhaps we would have 50 feet of water where we didn't have 50 feet of water before. In other words, the glaciers, uh, the Antarctica and Arctic uh, would melt and uh, sea levels would go up everywhere. It's a slow process, but that's what would happen if we left CO2 where it is today. <sighs> Not a comfortable thought. All right, let's talk about the recent past and monarch butterflies. And we're going to talk about east and west here. So um, this slide is pretty dramatic. I could move this. Oh, I can move it. Look at that. I can move that. Let's move that over there. Aha. I moved it over there so I can see the, the right side of my slides. All right. This is Phoenix. And I worked in Phoenix, the Phoenix area for my PhD for about three years in the, in the early 19 um, or the late um, 1960s and early 70s, I spent a lot of time working in alfalfa fields out there. And I'm glad I was working then and not now because look at where the temperature is now. And look what happened last summer. Last summer, the mean temperature in Phoenix was almost 97 degrees Fahrenheit, highest it's ever been. The temperature in Phoenix for the period for which, for which there is data has been going up half a degree per decade. If we took the last 30 years, it would be over a degree a decade. Amazing amount of change, frightening amount of change. Oops, now I can't advance my slide. Why is that? Hmm. All right, I did advance the slide. All right, this slide, oops, where am I? That's Phoenix. This should be Carson City. All right. I'm having trouble here because I moved everything. Yeah. All right. Let's go back. Doesn't like me to be that, do that. Hmm. All right. I'll have to look at another screen here. All right, I uh, skipped over a slide, but that's all right. Um, this shows you San Antonio, I believe. I can't see it. What am I doing here? Let's put this over here like this. All right, let's go to some. Uh, all right. Go to Carson City. Let's look going to Carson City, Nevada. I'll just leave this uh, image over there on the right because it. Otherwise, I get into trouble. All right. Uh, when we look at Carson City, Nevada, look how fast temperatures are increasing there at about, about eight tenths of a degree per, per decade. Um, it's just, you know, those are just outrageously uh, rapidly increasing temperatures. And, you know, you've got to wonder what's going to be happening in two decades from now with the, so that rate of increase. And then if we look at Savannah, Georgia, again, this is one of those 1975 um, uh, or 1970 sort of 
markers here, you see the temperatures were low in the 70s. And then after the 70s, everything just kind of took off. And we're looking at a very rapid rate of increase in the Savannah, Georgia area. Now, why Savannah? What would have to be happening in Savannah? And what would be happening in San Antonio in contrast? San Antonio is increasing temperatures to be sure. Again, you can see those 1970 markers, but uh, what's going on in San Antonio? It's not increasing as fast as everybody else or every place else. But what is happening in San Antonio is really striking in another regard because there they have a record of how many 100 degree days occurred from every decade. And if you go back to the 1890s, you see that there were in that decade, there were 39 days in the entire decade when the temperature got to over 100 degrees. That's, you know, that's about four days a year. And then you go over to the 2010s, and I would like to see this updated, but this is the best graph I've got. You're talking about 17.4 days a year where the temperature is over 100 degrees. Holy moly. Wow. I mean, that's just that's an incredible change in you know 120 years. That's remarkable. That means 100 degree days are going to be really common in the future. And I've got graphs to show you all of that, but uh, I've left them out of this particular presentation because I don't want to get too depressing here. But we are dealing with uh, a series of changing conditions, and we have to understand that. Okay, monarchs west of the divide. We're talking now about what might be happening in the West Coast. And I've been looking at that quite a bit and I can't tell you what I think is happening in great detail because it's still kind of formative, but it looks like the West Coast monarch population has seen its better days. That doesn't look like it's gonna be able to recover because it, uh, it really took a hit with weather changes. So this, you can see what's happening in the population. The population has declined significantly through time. Uh, just as the eastern population has declined, and it's now vanishingly low. This last year, there was uh, less than 2,000 uh, monarchs overwintered at the overwintering sites along the California coast. And uh, of those, a uh, very small proportion is going to survive the winter, and it, the chances are that uh, there's going to be a very, very small number the coming uh, year, much, much smaller than 2,000 this coming, this next winter after this season. We can already see that in the data. So if we look at California in detail and you know, to see what's happened out there, uh, this is a, a really kind of an interesting graphic because if you break this down into 30-year uh, intervals, and you see over there to the left, I've got uh, one th uh, 19,001, 1901 to 1930, it was 68.4, that was the mean temperature. And then you go up to 31 through 60, you see it's 69.4. And then you go up to 61 to 90 and it's 69.5. Wow, I mean, there's not much change. There's, you changed 1.1 degree in you know, 90 years. 1.1 degree in 90 years, that's not bad. You know, you're, you're talking um, really small rate of change, but then look what happened the next. Holy smoke, what's happening next? You move to uh, the next 30, years you've moved, bumped it up 1.4 degrees. So most of the change that has occurred in California occurred in the last 30 years. And that's significant for the Western population because it has changed the dynamics along the Western coast. Now what's really changed on the West coast is that the temperature of the ocean, you see these stars here, you can see San Diego, Santa Barbara, Monterey, and Marin County uh, where those stars are. The ocean just outside of those stars, just to the left of them, has been heating up. The Pacific Ocean is heating because of climate change. It's slow, but it's heating. And the effect of that heating is that you're heating up the coastal areas. And so the temperatures along the coast are changing in response to the oceanic temperatures, which are just, just off those coasts. That ocean current that came down, that's actually coming down from the north along the, you know, it comes down from Alaska, comes down from uh, uh, far north on the western part of Canada, and then comes down from uh, Washington, Oregon, California as a cold stream of water. But it's now heating up because of the overall heating of the surface water of the ocean. And that is having an effect along the California coast. 
And this is probably really hard to look at, but the point I'm trying to make here with this particular slide is that if you look at San Diego, which we can look at right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in San Diego in 1998, there were 18 overwintering sites. Now, if we go to 2018, there's only three left. And the number of butterflies has dropped from you know, 2,500, 2,600 to down to 12 butterflies in 2018. And what the general pattern is happening is th these butterflies are moving up the coast. They're moving up into Marin County, which is for the furthest north of those stars that I showed you on the previous map. And what's happening is that Marin County as an overwintering site is now becoming uh, more and more uh, predominant, as you can see within, uh, we got into uh, Marin County and um, uh, in these later years, the, the proportion of the total population that was being counted was actually increasing through time um, due to this shift to the north. There's another way to look at this, which I can show you here, which looks at the temperature changes before and after 2000 um, in at these overwintering sites. And you can see that the temperatures have been increasing uh, on the order of one and a half to two and a half degrees, depending upon where you are uh, on the coast. And it appears if you look at all of these data that some, if you get overwintering temperatures that are approaching about three degrees or 53 degrees Fahrenheit, so that is, those are the mean temperatures, that the colonies break up earlier or they don't form at all. So there's a, there's a relationship here between uh, the temperatures that the monarchs need to overwinter successfully and the temperatures that are occurring at these overwintering sites in California. So it appears that the California sites are losing their capability of, of keeping monarchs uh, through the winter long enough uh, so that they can get through the winter in a, in a non-reproductive condition so they can start the the population in the spring when the milkweeds become available in the spring. So there, it looks like a mismatch is developing between uh, overwintering and this, the spring milkweeds. Well, I'm gonna summarize all of this uh, quickly. The, you know, the mean, mean temperatures along the California coast have increased by an average of two degrees Fahrenheit uh, over the last couple of decades. The numbers overwintering uh, sites and monarchs are declining in the Southern California and Northern California counties now contain higher proportions of the total overwintering monarch population. Uh, temperature uh, increases during the fall and winter over the next 20 years will impact the number and distribution of overwintering sites. And there are higher breeding temperatures which are being uh, shown to occur in uh, areas to the east of California and uh, to the north uh, in the uh, Northwestern states. Uh, those higher temperatures are gonna have a negative impact on population growth. So another thing that's going on in California and the West in general, and that is that they're getting to have bigger intervals between rainfall events. And that um, has, creates a hardship in terms of nectar production by the plants, and therefore has a cascading effect on the butterflies as well, because uh, you go well, long periods without uh, rainfall and then you go to periods where you have a dearth of nectar and that's affecting the, the butterflies as well because they need that nectar for energy. So you're gonna have an increasing number of days with uh, temperatures over hundred degrees in the West and that's gonna affect the, uh, the breeding range of the monarch butterflies in the West as well. So based on Thanksgiving counts in the West, population increases um, are associated uh, with temperatures that are close to the long-term averages and population decreases are, are associated with uh, higher than average uh, temperatures. Negative factors involve temperatures that occur from uh, January to February and, uh, and along the coast uh, from March and April and uh, when you get the first generation being produced and so on and so forth. So there's a whole bunch of negative factors that I've identified here. I won't go into the detail here because you're not from the West, but the point here is that the weather events that occur in various portions of the year are having a, uh, they're increasing and they're having a negative effect on population growth. Uh, total populations uh, kind of uh, for a number of years range pretty close to the same number uh, 205,000 to 235,000 
um, suggests that the, the habitat loss is not a major driver of the monarch numbers over the last 20 years in the West. Uh, rather that what's happened since 2016 is the real driver in which we had extremely hot summers, we had hot falls, we had droughts, uh, we had very poor wintering conditions. So there's just been a, a cascade of negative events for about a two year period that has had the effect of driving down monarchs on the Western population. Uh, that hasn't been published yet, but I think we, once we pull all of that together, it'll come out to be a pretty clear picture that the cascade that we saw, the negative cascade in the West was a, a kind of bad luck. It was really bad conditions that occurred over about a two year period, uh, one after another, after another. Usually you have bad conditions and they're followed by good conditions and then good conditions by bad and so on and so forth. Usually it oscillates back and forth. It's very, very rare to see bad conditions that string out over uh, a two to a three year period. And that's what we're seeing in the West. Okay, future droughts and high temperatures will limit population growth in the Northwest and contributions to overwintering colonies from the Northwest and West are going to are likely vary substantially from year to year, but they overall are gonna be declining. So I'm working on what is called a stage specific model that predicts the direction of population change. Um, 13 out of the 18 years that I've looked at the data. So um, I think I'm on the right track in terms of being able to, to see what's happening there. Uh, I'm using this, um, a stage specific model, that is the stages representing all of the stages of the development of the population throughout the year, um, the birth rates, the death rates, and so on and so forth, looking at one generation after another after another. And using that kind of a model and kind of understanding how the population is affected with each stage, then you can come up with the ability to make some general predictions about where the population is going, whether it's up or down, but it still isn't precise enough to predict the amplitude of the change. All right, let's talk about the monarchs east of the divide and just move on here. Um, this is kind of a scary map, but it, it generally shows what's happening uh, across the United States. And it, uh, there is a reason for this. You can see that I have mapped out uh, the, the amount of temperature change per decade for states in the West, states along the Gulf Coast, states in the upper, mid, uh, upper uh, Northeast. And then you see, look at the Midwest. Wow, you get to say North Dakota, South Dakota, um, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, Oklahoma, Kansas, Oklahoma. And the changes aren't occurring as rapidly in the Midwest as they are along the coast. Why is that? goes back to the oceans. The oceans which are heating up, the Gulf Coast which is heating up. I showed you a savanna picture earlier. You've got warm waters along all of our coasts that are so warm now, they're affecting the temperatures inland. At the same time, you have the jet stream that sits over Canada, just above Minnesota and North Dakota that keeps those temperatures in the Midwest from getting too warm. If that jet stream slips further north, we're gonna see a lot of 100 degree days in the Midwest. But as long as the jet streams um, hang where they are, they, they don't move out of, the, out of the normal pattern, we're gonna see relatively modest changes in temperature uh, in the Midwest. And that's good for Missouri, it's good for Kansas, it's good for agriculture, it's good for everything. We want to have the kind of status quo. We want, don't want to be a California, we don't want to be a, a, an Oregon, we don't want to be uh, even be a Texas in terms of our temperature change. We want to be where we are, which is a slow pace of change because that allows us to adapt. So that's the good news. The good news is that the central part of the country, the heartland, the thing the place that we know and love is not going to change rapidly due to climate, at least not in the near future. So that's good news. That's positive. All right, nicely tagged butterfly feeding on a late fall flower going into the overwintering sites in Mexico. It's a, a dramatic uh, image. I hope a lot of you get to see that at some time. It's, it's really spectacular. It's life-changing when you do that. Then we look at the eastern population and you can see the eastern population is bouncing around. 
and it has dropped significantly from what it was in the 70s, or I mean in the 90s, and now it's um, you know bouncing around be somewhere between um, six hectares and you know maybe one and a half hectares, two hectares, depending upon how good the seasonal conditions are. Now, in terms of maintaining the Midwestern population, as you've probably heard from their previous talks, uh, the biggest issue has been loss of habitat. And we're scrambling like crazy to try to replace a lot of habitat that's been lost as a result of changes in agriculture, uh, changes in uh, development. Um, we've had an awful lot of growth of cities that has gobbled up a lot of land and so on and so forth. So the loss of habitat has been key. But when you look at these, uh, um, changes from year to year, you're looking at changes that are primarily due to climate and those, or uh, well, it's better be more accurate to call it weather, weather events which change the success, the reproductive success of monarchs. So let's get into some of that. So um, one of the things I'm concerned about is even though we talk about the rate of change in the US and the Midlands uh, on our Midwest is relatively slow compared to the rest of the country, it still is of concern because those changes, if they occur at certain times of the year, can have an impact. I'm particularly concerned about March temperatures in Texas. That's when the butterflies first come back from Mexico. And when they come back from Mexico, uh, they, they need to have a really kind of average conditions to do well. We want them to lay all of their eggs in Texas because they will develop uh, faster there. They will uh, produce a good first generation and so on and so forth. But if the temperatures get too hot in Texas, the butterflies tend to blow too far north too soon. They get ahead of milkweed. They get into areas with late frosts and so on and so forth and the lower temperatures for sure and the developmental rate slows down. Basic principle of population ecology is that populations that grow best and grow fastest are the ones that have the shortest age to first reproduction. What that means is that we have to keep those mamas laying all their eggs in Texas because that's where they will develop the fastest and they will get the best reproduction for that first generation. So what I'm interested in is what are those conditions in Texas in March? I don't want to see those monarchs move too far north too soon. That's been clear. We've seen enough of that in 2017, 2012 to know that that's a negative. Even in 2010, we saw too much in the way of monarchs moving too far north too soon. So we want to take a look at what's going to happen or what has been happening. And so I've looked at the temperatures for the first and second half of 94 to 2018. And we take a look at uh, the Texas March temperatures and we go from um, 1994 to 2005 and it's, it's increased by 0.81 degrees. That's a pretty good increase. But then if we go to 2006, 2018, uh oh, now we're talking 3.4 degrees uh, increase above, that is above the long-term average. That's not good. That means that the monarchs have been pushed too far north too soon, too many of those years. And then you can look at the, see the rest of the year, and I won't go through all of these, but the rest of the year, uh, including the fall migration, August, September, um, for the Midwest, you're seeing a much lower rate of change, and that's, that's good but it's those March temperatures that scare me. We're also seeing, and I don't have it on this particular graph, we're seeing an increase in September temperatures. And the September temperatures tend to uh, slow down the migration and that tends to lead to smaller numbers of monarchs getting to the overwintering sites. So there's a lot of interactions here that kind of determine the overall numbers, but uh, <clears throat> overall the, the, uh, the temperatures are, pretty much the drivers, they just drive things differently in different parts of the season. So if we take a look at, uh, let's look at the lower half of this, the last three lines. The mean projected March temperatures for uh, somewhere between 2040 and 2050 are gonna be about plus six Fahrenheit. That's gonna put monarchs in, in a bad situation you know, 20 years from now. Um, and the monarchs have declined nine out of the 11 years with the temperatures greater than 1.9 uh, degrees Fahrenheit above the long-term average. And monitor numbers have increased four out of four years with temperatures less than 1.5 uh, degrees um, uh, below the long-term average. In other words, the cooler it is in Texas, 
the better it is. That seems to be counterintuitive, but that's just the way it's working. We keep those butterflies in Texas when they return and you will have a population that will grow much faster than, uh, than if it was too warm. Okay, monarchs in the near future, we're getting to the end folks. Let's look at the data. Average uh, April to October temperatures in Oklahoma, they're looking like they're not really changing much and that's a good thing. That's, that's again, a good news. Um, and going back to our optimum, again, our UR and enzyme sort of discussion, uh, we have to keep in mind that these, uh, these organisms are very sensitive to these temperature changes and a slight difference can make a big difference in how these butterflies or how any insects, whether we're talking about June bugs, corn earworms, what have you, are gonna respond. If again, it's the Goldilocks and the three bears sort of an idea can be too cold, too hot, or just right. And we want it to be just right for a lot of things. We don't want it to be too hot. But um, if it's too hot, there is ample evidence that realized fecundity, and realized fecundity is, you know, we have to talk about potential fecundity. The potential fecundity for a monarch butterfly might be 400 eggs. Realized fecundity might be 256 uh, for a whole cohort of butterflies. In other words, they're not laying the maximum number of eggs. There is kind of a, a real reality there that reduces the, the ability of the butterflies to find plants or to lay eggs because it's too hot or they can't get enough nectar or some, something. So we have to kind of understand what realized fecundity is uh, relative to the potential to understand how the populations are uh, functioning. Um, and with this applies not only to monarch butterflies, to pollinators and vertebrates in general. Uh, as, as to how they deal with weather conditions and sub, substantial deviations from long-term norms, extreme weather events, and xenobiotics. You're going, what in the heck are xenobiotics? Xenobiotics are man-made chemicals. And we've got a lot of them. You and I have probably got about 200 of them in our body somewhere in some small quantity. Yeah, we're, we're, lock, we're all walking and talking and, what have you, uh, examples of human enthusiasm for a chemical uh, um, adjuvants of one sort or another. And we have pesticides in us, we have uh, all sorts of plastic uh, coatings in us and things of that sort. Uh, you know, we've got an amazing number of, of chemicals in us. Fortunately, they are small enough so that they're not affecting human health in most cases but we have to be alert to the possibility that that can happen. And it has happened. We have examples of it where people have been picking up too much of these compounds and they have had long-term effects. What we don't know is how many of these compounds are being picked up by uh, insects, how that's affecting their metabolism, how that's affecting their realized fecundity and so on and so forth. And there's a real potential there that we're missing it. We're really not understanding all of the dynamics that are occurring out there. All right, the impact of weather on pollinator habitat, plant interactions. There can be a cascade of number of effects after temperatures significantly exceed long-term averages. Effects that can be amplified if droughts occur simultaneously. So negative interactions. Let's talk about the negative interactions that say we're talking about a monarch butterfly or almost anything that needs nectar. As temperature increases, metabolism increases. There is an increased demand for water and carbohydrates from nectar to maintain bodily functions. Meeting these demands becomes increasingly difficult since nectar secretion declines at higher temperatures and flowering duration shortens with both declining, with both declining if the high temperatures occur during uh, drought conditions. In other words, if you're an insect that is dependent on nectar, you do not want to have high temperatures and you do not want to have a drought at the same time because your resource base just disappears very rapidly. That's going to affect your realized fecundity. It's going to affect um, your overall population success. And that is a carryover that could go for years uh, for, for a lot of insects. All right, pollinators, you know, if you have these negative outcomes, reduce longevity, reduce lower uh, realized fecundity, and that is lifetime reproductive success, compromise survival of offspring, lower populations in the following generations for, for seasons. And the plants, you know, this is a, a big concern for agriculture. You're going to get reduced seed set, higher abortion rates, lower protein or nutrient, 
and nutrient content, uh, reduce seed viability. I mean, there, there's big concerns on agriculture about all of these uh, temperature increases because it's gonna change the nutrition of the plants that we eat. Uh, and think of that in relative to everything else that's out there. If, new, if our crops are gonna lose nutritional value or in the terms of the amount of protein content and so on and so forth, that's certainly gonna be happening to a lot of native vegetation as well. And that's gonna have a cascading effect on the things that need that protein that the native vegetation produces. So we're, we're looking at something that we don't fully understand except that we can see trends and uh, we don't know how it's all gonna work out. It's complicated out there. All right, long-term outcomes. Prolonged weather changes are expected to result in niche shifts, that is uh, shifts in distribution among both pollinators and plants resulting in major uh, major changes in the composition of, of communities and ecosystems. The distributions of both insect and wind pollinator crops are expected to shift as well. Think about that. All right, this is my parting thought. And I've thought about this for a while and how to, how to place our, our dilemma here in some sort of a, a context, an historical context. And so I came up with the rhythms of life shaped by millions of years of evolution are being challenged and altered by a rapidly changing climate. The connections long established between plants and their pollinators are of particular concern, since these interdependencies shape uh, nearly all terrestrial ecosystems. Our future will be defined by how well we understand and maintain these connections. Yes, we better get with it because things are changing. And if we don't understand how they're changing, why they're changing, it's all on us. Um, well, with that, I think I can stop. We need to keep these monarchs in going. Can't let the sunset set on the monarch migration. We need your help. We need everybody to step up and contribute and maintain prairies, restore habitats, do what we can to keep everything intact. And it's true, butterflies aren't free. If we value monarchs, pollinators will have to invest in their conservation. As part of this process, we can't ignore greenhouse gases. We have to lobby in order to get the world to reduce greenhouse gases. There's just no other choice. Well, with that, thank you. That's all I have. And I'm not sure I've run over time, but I'd be glad to take some questions. Chip, thank you very much. That's a very sobering, but you're right. It's really important to have those data. And we do have a number of questions. Um, thank everybody for participating and asking questions. So Chip, I'm gonna go through um, as many of these as I can get to. Um, some questions about, uh, let me get here. Um, when you were showing the um, slides of the temperature increases in the different areas. There's a question. It looks like there's a, is there a change in the standard deviation over time? There seems to be less variation in temperature. Uh, for example, in Phoenix, it just seems to go straight up. Well, I haven't done the statistics on that, but uh, I, yes, I, what, we, what we're seeing is in a number of the temperature uh, profiles that we're looking at, we're seeing a change in the amplitude of variation. So in other words, the, the amount of difference in between the highs and the lows uh, over a period of years seems to be collapsing. So we get less change, less variation through time. We see that particularly in October and March, you know, our changing uh, periods of the year. We're seeing changes in amplitude of variation from year to year. And I don't know what that's due to. Um, climatologists I've talked to don't know what that's due to either. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, there's a question, does Monarch Joint Venture or perhaps Monarch Watch or any other group have plans to create a website feature like National Audubon where visitors can view the future climate effects on a species up to three degrees of change? Um, I'm not familiar with what Audubon is doing, and I would like to know what Audubon is doing. So if somebody would send me that uh, link, uh, I would be happy to take a look at it. Uh, but, but I can tell you that MJV and Monarch Watch are not um, at that point where we're able to 
um, do that. Uh, there are a lot of things we need to learn about monarchs and climate before we, I think we're in that position. Thank you. And so, yeah, if anybody, uh, we'll, we'll look for that uh, for you, Chip, and get that to you. Um, question, um, are monarchs overwintering in Florida? Oh, is the fact that monarchs are overwintering in Florida a new situation or have they been doing that for an extended period of time? And are there data on Florida overwintering numbers? Uh, what's going on in Florida is still something of a mystery. It looks like Florida is, uh, has a continuously breeding population. It doesn't look like butterflies that uh, go to Florida in the fall from the Northeast actually overwintered there. They, they become reproductive and they start reproducing through the winter months. They go through two or three generations. And what is not clear is whether butterflies come out of Florida and go north in the spring. So, you know, the, the interpretation that many of us have given to Florida, quite honestly, is it looks like it's a sink. What a sink means is that what goes in doesn't come out. In other words, it's a loss. It's a net loss state, but we don't know that for sure. It's just that that's what it looks like right now. Thank you. Uh, question, I've heard that over that increasing milkweed in the upper Midwest is key to monarch survival. How does that in fit, fit in with your thesis or does it? Yeah, it does. I mean, most of the milkweed that's been lost has been lost as a result of adoption of Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. I mean, there used to be a lot of milkweed in corn and soybean fields. And then starting in the early 2000s, uh, the growers began to adopt these uh, herbicide tolerant varieties of corn and soybeans and that they would be able to spray those with glyphosate uh, that is Roundup and that would uh, eliminate the milkweed and we saw a dramatic drop in monarch butterflies as milkweed was eliminated in corn and soybean fields and then we had uh, 2007 we had the renewable fuel standard that was signed by President Bush um, into effect that uh, created the interest in producing alcohol from corn and that created a tremendous demand for acreage and a tremendous shift in agriculture in the upper Midwest uh, that had the effect of taking a lot of land that had been kind of uh, marginal land and converting it into uh, corn acreage to produce alcohol. Uh, the effect of that was to have a, a conversion of landscape over a, a four year period that amounted to an area of the size of the state of Indiana uh, I mean, just a tremendous amount of change in a very short time. And that too had an impact on the amount of milkweed in the landscape and the amount of monarch, butter, monarch butterflies uh, that could be supported on a yearly basis. In other words, it was just kind of a double whammy. You had the herbicide tolerant plants and then you had the demand for alcohol from corn uh, that had the effect of having a major impact on the amount of milkweed out there so that if we want to restore the population, we obviously have to go to the upper Midwest and restore a lot of milkweeds in the upper Midwest. And the calculations are that we have to bring back and establish something like 1.4 billion, that's billion with a B, milkweed stems out there in the landscape. And so, yeah, it's the upper Midwest, which is the target. And the reason that's a target is, you know, we've established on the tagging program, established with tagging that over 70% of the monarchs have reached Mexico come out of the upper Midwest. So um, that's why the upper Midwest is really important. So that means, that means, and we're talking about Missouri on North. We're talking about, you know, from Michigan over to the Eastern Dakotas. Uh, that's the heartland of production for monarch butterflies. Thank you. Um, many people believe that monarchs can thrive without migration. Can Chip explain why monarchs need migration for survival? Well, if, you know, monarchs survive in many, many places around the world without migration, and uh, they um, they do quite well in Hawaii. They don't migrate there. They do quite well in in Spain and Portugal and, and the coastal areas and a few places where there's introduced milkweed. They, uh, you know, they don't migrate a great deal in in New Zealand. They don't migrate a great deal in. Uh, Australia, they, they do migrate some in both of those places, but you know, there are just a lot of places monarchs don't migrate and uh, they're all over Pacific Islands and they do just fine without migrating. The problem is 
that with the migration, we have one of the most magnificent natural phenomena in the planet, one that we don't fully understand. And uh, if we lose that, uh, we lose uh, a connection with uh, people that is just um, amazing. I mean, that I, I was, uh, you know, we had a conference last night with uh, um, Sarah Dykeman, who traveled back and forth from mm -hmm. uh, Mexico on a bike following the migration. And, and you know, one of the things I pointed out was in the introducing Sarah was, you know, that, that a lot of us make connections with Marx. And a lot of those connections are, you know, really personal, they're really hard to explain. But part of those, you know, connections have to do with almost a spiritual connection with this butterfly. I mean, it's really hard to be not emotionally moved when you go to Mexico and see these masses of butterflies and to realize that they have gone you know, 1,500 to 2,000 miles to get there. And then to realize that a lot of them die just shortly after they get there. I mean, it's, it's a life force. It's a demonstration of life that we don't see with a lot of other organisms. And if you become involved with this, it's hard not to be emotionally connected to it. So, you know, I don't think we want to lose that. I surely don't want to lose that. Thank you. Some other questions about uh, climate in uh, different states as well. Um, the impact of temperature is very interesting. Have you also considered changes in rainfall? Yeah, well, I kept mentioning drought. You know, it's kind of hard to quantify drought, but I mean, there are two couple of ways that drought really has an impact. In, in California, what we're seeing is that the, the interval between rainfall events is increasing. In other words, you know, if we started out, you know, 40 years ago where the interval between rainfalls was say 15 days in the West and some part of the West, and now it's 34 days. Well, that makes a big difference on the amount of nectar out there because that has a big difference on the amount of, of moisture that's available to the plants. So, so we're, we're seeing, you know, that there's there are kind of two effects of rainfall, how much rainfall there is and the intervals between uh, rainfall events. So yeah, uh, rainfall can have a big impact. It's really, you know, it's intuitive. We can see it, but we can't measure it quantitatively as easily as we can some of these other things. Thank you. Can you speak about the role of herbicides? Uh, for example, uh, one uh, person wrote in, noticing spray from neighboring fields has affected the flowering of my native trees, which then decreases the food source for native pollinators. So, um, of course, you know, you really focused on climate change in this presentation, um, but of course, uh, herbicides do play a, a significant role. Can you discuss that a bit? Well, I'm not a herbicide expert, and I just, I, there are a lot of battles about this sort of thing, but there's a lot of obvious stuff. I mean, we've, we've got a, a class of herbicides that are being, or a class of insecticides that are being used called Neonics. Neonics are insecticides, but they are having very pernicious effects on uh, populations. We also have fungicides and herbicides out there that are having pernicious effects. Uh, you know, they, these are the xenobiotics. And uh, one of the studies I saw recently was a study on honeybees um, showing that they apparently, in Switzerland, they apparently had evolved uh, a lot of uh, genetic modifications to deal with the fact that the environment was now polluted with a lot of these herbicides uh, and insecticides and other xenobiotics that had not been present you know, 40 and 50 years ago. So some organisms based on their life histories and uh, reproductive capabilities and genetic flexibility can uh, make these changes and adapt to uh, changing xenobiotic usage of one sort or another and other organisms cannot. Things which have long life histories and low reproductive rates are not going to be able to make a lot of uh, adaptations or evolutionary changes or genetic changes or, um, in response to these man-made chemicals. So, so this, is, this is a real concern and herbicides are being overused. We know that. Uh, we, you know, we talked about the, the issue of Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. Um, uh, the use of herbicides in that capacity. 
but we're seeing a lot of that along roadsides. We're seeing a lot of that along areas where herbicides just shouldn't be used. Uh, but we have a lot of push for that, right? I mean, people want to have they want to have roadsides that look like they belong in a golf course. Well, that's a cost. I mean, there's there's a cost to, to do that. You have to use herbicides. That's costly, but it's also costly for wildlife. Thank you. Can you speak about the role of uh, disease in monarch survival? And also, just do, do changing temperatures affect disease transmission? Yeah, there's an interesting and complicated dynamic. Um, you know, monarchs are subject to a lot of diseases. The principal one that we have to deal with is something called OE, which is a shortened version of saying something complicated like Ophriocystis electroshera, OE. All right, that's a protozoan disease that um, is carried by female monarchs uh, as spores on their abdomen. They lay eggs on plants, and as they lay their eggs, they shake off a few spores that land on the leaf surface, and the caterpillars eat those spores, and they can build up. Well, that's a disease that is a kind of a self-limiting disease. Uh, by self-limiting disease, I mean that while it will build up and it will eventually have a negative effect on the population, it won't kill everything. There's going to be a... Um, uh, there's going to be a point where the population drops beyond a, a certain point, and there's going to be a, a kind of escape from the predators or the parasite for a while, and the population will build up again. What I'm clumsily trying to say is that with most OE populations, it's going to cycle. It's going to go up, and then it's going to go down. And there, uh, to complicate this further in terms of this discussion, there are density dependent relationships and frequency dependent relationships in a system like this. What that means is that if you have a lot of females in the system and relatively few plants, you're gonna have a high OE infestation. If you have a lot of plants and very little in the way of monarch butterflies reproducing, you're gonna have a low um, infestation rate with the disease. It's a frequency dependent, density dependent sort of interaction if you can follow all of that. Um, so uh, the diseases cycle, the diseases will keep populations down, but they're not, as far as we can see with monarchs, they're not going to kill all the monarchs. Thank you. Uh, what's your opinion, Chip, on individuals raising monarchs? Is it overall a benefit or too many possible negative aspects? For example, a nature center that might raise and release hundreds of monarchs a year. Yeah, that's a very controversial sort of thing. There are a lot of people that are against it. Um, my general feeling is that we, in order to support monarch conservation, we have to get the public, public involved. And the public, if the public wants to engage themselves in, in doing, raising a few butterflies that would otherwise die because of predators, I don't see that there's, that's harmful. Um, yeah, we are writing a paper now which uh, deals with a, a lot of reared butterflies that have been tagged and released. And a surprising number of those get to Mexico. They don't get to Mexico as well as the wild butterflies do. And there are lots of reasons for that. And we're gonna outline all of those reasons. Um, I mean, people need to learn how to raise monarch butterflies so that they are uh, disease free, so that they are large and robust and they have to release them at the right time of year. If they release them too late, they're not going to make it to Mexico, no matter how good they are. So, so, so if they raise them on substandard food, they're not going to make it to Mexico. If they raise them um, in their disease, they're not going to make it to Mexico. So, you know, if people are going to do this, uh, we urge them to do it right. I'm not going to tell people not to do things. I'm not of that sort. Um, I think we, uh, what I want is I want people engaged. Um, but if they're going to be engaged, let's do it right. Thank you. Um, now getting into some questions about what people can do, actions that people can do is a question. What's better for the environment, a white roof or solar panels on a roof? Uh, I can't tell you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I flew over Phoenix a while back, about a year ago. I mean, it's, we lost a year, didn't we? 
that's more than a year ago. Um, but I flew over Phoenix and I was surprised to see a lot of white roofs as well as solar panels on roofs. So the white roofs are gonna reflect the energy back into space and it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna cut down on the, um, um, the refrigerating costs, the, uh, um, the air conditioning costs for the building, uh, the temperature control for the building. So that's gonna be an energy saver. If you put uh, solar panels on a roof, you're gonna be able to generate energy that can run the air conditioners. <laughs> so I, I don't know which works best, uh, uh, the, uh, the white roof or the, the, uh, the solar panels, but I would bet on a solar panels. Um, and in the long term, I would think that they would save you more, more uh, energy. But there, are, uh, if, that's at a higher cost too. So if you, I haven't looked into the costs of both, but I would suppose that if the solar panels cost you more, takes you more to pay off that saving. But uh, I, I would go with the solar panels because I think you get more flexibility that way. Thank you. Um, does it matter what kind of milkweed a person plants? And of course, uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation, we're, we're broadcasting this from Missouri. Chip is in um, Kansas. And of course, we have people uh, today from all over North America. Um, could you speak just to, for a couple of minutes, Chip, about uh, what do you think are the best kinds of milkweed for different parts of the monarch uh, re re breeding region? Well, for the Northeast, we recommend common milkweed, swamp milkweed, and then butterfly weed in that order. So we are considered, you know, Kansas and Missouri and virtually everywhere north of us and east of us. Those would be the three species that we would uh, preferably select. If we're uh, talking about further west, we would go with showy milkweed in the Northwest. We would, in California, there's about five milkweeds that are pretty much unique to California and a few small areas of the West that we would recommend. You know, Cal Californica, Arosa, uh, Fasicularis, uh, and so on. Uh, if we were, you know, if we're dealing with Oklahoma and Texas, we talk about three different milkweeds there. We talk about uh, a green antelope horn, antelope horn, and something called Zizotes. Uh, we have nurseries and we have a nursery in Texas that we work with that produces those three plants that are distributed in Texas and Oklahoma. So it depends upon where we are in the country. Um, uh, the eastern half of the country, we predominantly those three milkweeds, although we could bring in a couple of others like uh, Verticillata uh, in some of the east um, and maybe a couple of others, but those, those are minor plants. The major plant for most of the breeding area for monarch butterflies is common milkweed. That's what most of the monarchs are produced on at the end of the season that reach Mexico, common milkweed. The tall kind of frustrating plant for a lot of people because it, it clones and it has rhizomes that sneak out into the lawn and it doesn't behave itself and everybody kind of gets, oh, I wish that plant would behave itself. I wish that plant would stay where it's supposed to stay. Well, uh, get over it. It's plant enjoy the plant for what it does. It's what nature does. I, I, I enjoy that plant. It, it, if it shows up in the middle of the path, you just dig up the rhizome and plant it someplace else. Thanks, Chip. And we're going to need to sign off at 530. But with the time that we have left, um, just about five minutes, there are a number of questions about what can people do? What can people do on an individual basis and in the communities where they live both to combat climate change and to do things specifically to help monarchs? Well, let's start with uh, monarchs first. And let monarch, you know, we started a program in 2005 called Monarch Waste Stations. At that point, I realized that uh, habitats were declining for monarch butterflies because of the email I'd gotten from a farmer that was adopting Roundup Ready Corn. And so it means he was telling me he was eliminating all the monarchs from his, his uh, property. And I'm going, oh my goodness, we gotta do something about it. So we started a monarch waste station program. We have over 30 something thousand uh, monarch waste stations registered throughout the country. These are anything from small postage stamp sort of gardens that you could put alongside your sidewalk somewhere, alongside your house, or you could have them up to you know 5,000 acres, um, whatever, um, whatever you know. You could, they, monarch waste stations could be of any size. So 
creating habitats for monarch butterflies is something that everybody could do that owns property. And we have programs, if you go to our website, for distributing free milkweeds for uh, restoration, distributing free milkweeds for the schools and nonprofits. And then we have a, a milkweed market for people who want to buy milkweed for one purpose or another. So that's one thing you can do for monarchs to create habitat and encourage other people to create habitat. Go to your municipality, get them to involved and so on and so forth. As far as climate change is concerned, we just have to lo lobby and lobby and lobby for uh, energy conservation and distributed energy sources. I mean, there's, there's a big movement now to go through distributed energy. What I'm talking about with distributed energy is uh, wind, thermal, um, uh, you know, geothermal and uh, um, solar, oh, what else, uh, hydro, any sort of energy that is not fossil fuel based, we really have to encourage that. Um, and, and I think what we're going to see is a lot of people doing what they can to um, both increase the albedo, that is to increase the reflective surfaces out there and to incorporate um, solar panels in particular and you could even uh, develop uh, uh, wind turbines for homes um, so that we could, uh, you know, homes could generate a sufficient amount of energy to uh, alleviate some of this problem. I think we're gonna see a lot of developments in terms of energy efficiency. And I think the, the public has to encourage all of those uh, so that we can move forward and move away from fossil fuels as fast as we can. Thank you, Chip. Uh, and also, uh, there are some comments from others about, you know, check with your parks and recreation departments of your communities, um, work with groups like Missouri Master Naturalists and other uh, master gardeners who may have active programs where you live in terms of establishing monarch habitat. Check out the resources at Chip's organization, Monarch Watch. Um, I would add to uh, what you said, Chip, in addition to creating habitat is to protect existing habitat. For example, uh, original unplowed prairie, which is very rare in, in Missouri and in many other states, but uh, is remains vital habitat for monarch butterflies and so many other species. Uh, you, here in Missouri, you can learn about our work at moprairie.org and in fewer in other states. Um, do support local land trusts and agencies that are protecting original habitat. Um, we also have many sources at our Grow Native website. We, uh, uh, we have uh, native landscaping plans, native plant database, lots of resources about monarchs, including a, um, a document about monarchs and milkweeds in Spanish that may be helpful uh, to some of you. Um, and I also want to encourage all of you to tune in to our other upcoming webinars uh, every um, Wednesday at four through May, and then we'll go to a month after that. Of uh, particular interest this month, uh, we have a special Earth Day special on April 22nd on water quality and native plants with a, an excellent panel. And on April 28th, we have Sarah Dykeman, uh, who wrote the book, Bicycling with Butterflies, that Chip mentioned, and she um, rode the entire um, monarch migration route on bicycle, and she's going to be talking about that. It's going to be um, really a, like a wonderful presentation. Um, so with that, Chip, any final word? Let me know, Let Thank you so much, Chip, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, Brooke will send a link to uh, this recorded webinar to you tomorrow and some other resources that ha have been mention mentioned uh, during Chip's presentation. Thank you again very much, Chip, and everyone have a wonderful evening. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>